Thank you so much, Eva. What a beautiful tribute. We pray together this morning. God, as we come to this point in our worship service, uh, we continue to acknowledge your love and presence with us. And Father, we ask that your spirit would continue to speak and be very evident in this place, Lord, as we now turn to your word and the message. Lord, we pray that it would be your voice and your word that is heard in this place. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Just a quick little preview. Uh, next Sabbath, I hope that you are also planning to come, if, if possible, and worship with us again here at Scottsdale Thunderbird. We have two more baptisms next Sabbath that we're looking forward to. Uh, one of them is here today. <laughs> the other one will be back. But Jade Nosenia and Toby uh, Lounsbury are getting baptized uh, this next Sabbath. And then also, I think it's been confirmed and arranged that we're also having a baby dedication. So David Nathaniel Picon uh, uh, will be also uh, dedicated uh, by Pastor Ryan. And uh, where's Anissa? He is going to be here, right? And will he be here Wednesday too? Have you all met Pastor Ryan Johnson yet? Yeah, I hope, I hope that you're able to come next week because Pastor Ryan will be doing the baby dedication and uh, then we'll have the baptisms as well. It's just going to be a really fun, lovely service. We're going to celebrate family, celebrate uh, God's gift of His children to us, and uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. So just uh, next Sabbath, a little preview for you. I'm wrapping up my series that I've been doing on answers and attitudes today. Um, there's always more that we could talk about. Last week, I kind of dovetailed the two negative attitudes at the end together, that of doubt and then eventually rebellion. I said that once you've reached, if you've really embraced an attitude of doubt, the distance between doubt and outright rebellion, you're basically there. And that's how the story in the wilderness, the, excuse me, the wilderness wandering uh, develops uh, when the children of Israel said, nope, we can't go into the promised land. There's just giants. There's all these problems. They went right from that moment into rebellion. Well, I'm kind of doing the same on the positive attitude side of wrapping together faith and submission to God. And I'll, I'll illustrate that here in just a minute um, in, in bringing this series to con uh, a conclusion. But what I want to share with you is that it's not by accident that the last topic uh, on this journey is faith. You know, faith is one of the most beautiful things that God has given us. Faith is what really makes us different than the world. Not that the other building attitudes of being thankful and being content and having love and, and even that crowning one of, of being in total submission to God aren't uh, of their e equal weight and importance, but faith is really what makes us shine. When you think about the great stories of faith after the Bible, of course, there's many great stories of faith, of faith in the Bible, and some of them relate to the stories of the Bible, but the martyrs during the times of great uh, persecution or inquisition, we always marvel at their faith, right? That up until the point of torture and death, they would say, I will worship God. Jesus is my Savior. No matter what you do to me, my faith will not be shaken. That's we, we marvel at that, and we, we, we remark at that, and we appreciate that standard that is set. Um, in the uh, other great stories that I like to think about are, are the slaves in the American South, that despite their circumstances, despite their trials, they would still sing the, the Negro spirituals that we still benefit from today. They would sing, we are climbing Jacob's ladder. We are climbing. There, our circumstance right now might be dire, but the future is bright. I would rather have Jesus than silver and gold. And, and that ability to express such faith under such dire circumstances, again, we appreciate, we marvel. In the more modern age, uh, again, in a, a very difficult situation, when the Jews faced in the, the context of the Holocaust, even in those uh, uh, desperate and devastating moments who would still stand and say, no, regardless of what you do to me, my faith is strong. No matter what you take from me, I will continue standing on the faith of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Faith is truly a powerful and beautiful thing. Amen? 
We talk about faith. Faith has become one of those kind of churchy words that has been so absorbed into the, into the vocabulary that we don't really ever tend to spend time defining it. Or if we do, we, we might be somewhat superficial, kind of like grace and salvation and justification. These, oh, these are just very kind of churchy words that we throw around and we kind of assume everyone knows what we're talking about. Everyone knows exactly what that means. Well, believe me, we don't have time to go into everything what faith means and matters, but we're going to at least approach it um, from one direction today and try to see how faith really is uh, one of the pinnacle attitudes, attitudes that we can have. Not just a conviction or anything like that, but faith is actually a set-in attitude that we choose to have in our lives. So that's, that's how we're going to wrap this up. I like from Desire of Ages, it was in faith Faith in God's love and care that Jesus rested. It was in what that Jesus rested? Faith. Faith in His Father. Faith that no matter what happened, God had a plan. Faith that no matter what circumstances He would face, that the Father loved Him and would take care of Him. It was in faith that Jesus rested. And we are called Christians. We want to follow in the faith of Jesus Christ. We want to rest in that faith. And the power of that word which stilled the storm was the power of God. So if Jesus rested in faith, well, we cannot do any better than that. Okay, I only have, because I I knew we'd have less time today uh, because of the other elements of the service, I only have a couple of questions for the young people, but I'd love to have um, some microphone help so that others can hear. Thank you, Toby, and thank you, Derek. So again, I only have a couple here, uh, but I appreciate the young people from helping out. It's okay. I see your hand, Julian. So the kids had uh, children's church last week. They didn't get to hear some of this, so uh, uh, we'll see how they do. When the spies came back out of Canaan, what did they say? Which are these? Did they say it's filled with giants or the women are pretty? Lots of grasshoppers there. That might be a problem. The land is grand. The people are too strong. So Julian, what do you say here? A. He says it was filled with giants. Giants? Really? Okay. Okay. Anyone else? I'm going to take a couple answers here. All right, Isaiah. E. E, the people are too strong. Is that one of the things they said? All right, and is that Lindell? And Kylan. Yes. D. D, the land is very, it's good land. Was that also what you were going to say, Lindell? E. And another E. All right, and then we'll take, can you run to the booth here, Derek, Sebastian? Um... And Eric, I think. Is that Eric? All right. What do you say, Sebastian? A, D, and E. Oh, he's just hitting them all. And then Eric. A, D, and E. Oh, I think you guys got it. All right, Dylan, last one. I I don't want to leave you out here. D. E? Just E? All of them. All of them? Except C and D. Except B and C. All right. Man, you guys have got this. You are right. That is right. They said lots of things, other things I didn't put on here, but they said, yeah, great big people, that's a problem. They're awfully tough looking too. We don't think we can do it, but the land looks great. Uh, They said, we feel like grasshoppers. They didn't say the land had many grasshoppers. All right, number two, how did Israel respond to this report? Just, just in general, it doesn't have to be super specific. Were they, were they courageous? Did they say, yes, we can still do it? Or did they say, we're scared? Just how did the, the, the congregation respond to the spies' report? Okay, I see Dylan's hand, and then back here, I think that's Lindell. <laughs> Dylan, let's hear it. Scared. They were scared? All right. Sounds pretty scary to me. They were afraid. They were afraid? Afraid. Another afraid. All right, Julian, right behind you, bro. They were afraid. I think we got the fear part down. I think we got that. Other, other? Oh, yeah, hey, Gio. They weren't faithful. They were what? They weren't faithful. They weren't faithful. You're paying attention. All right. You can't keep them down, Nassim. It's just, you can try all you want. You're not going to keep them down. All right, Sebastian. They doubted God's promises. They doubted. And Eric. They tried to murder Joseph and Caleb. Now, you're cheating because you're reading my slides. (laughs) So, 
I was just about to give you all kinds of credit and say, wow. But I do want to say that's, that's being creative. That's being creative. Yeah, that's resourceful. All right, boys. You guys got it. You did. You got it. Uh, Derek and Toby, thank you. That, that was, I just had a couple questions for this morning, but thank you. They doubted. They did not believe the Lord, and that, we talked about that last week. They wept and despaired. They did. Caleb and Joshua were the only two that said, we can do it. They were the two of faith, and the community was so upset with them that said, uh, we can't have them in the camp at all. Let's uh, pick up rocks and just uh, take them out. Um, and they said, you know what? Egypt's looking pretty good right now. Let's go back to Egypt. That, that was the situation on the borders of the promised land. And again, as I began this series, I, I, I tried to emphasize and remind you that one of the reasons why we're looking at these stories is Paul tells us in the New Testament that the same attitudes and the same struggles that the children of Israel had at this time are our struggles too. He says they are an example to us. We need to look at their example. We need to look at their trials so that we are better equipped for when we deal with a similar or same trial. And I, was, I just want to tell you guys this. How far from the promised land are we today? Now, we're not talking about uh, Palestine or Israel, right? We're not talking about the country over in the Middle East. We're talking about the true promised land of God's kingdom, right? How far are we? How much prophecy is left? How, what, are the, what are the signs of the times telling us? It, doesn't it, as good Bible students, as people who appreciate uh, the, uh, the, uh, the prophecies that are given to us and all the, uh, the, that has been given to us as a denomination, we are not far. And as we see world events continue to develop, we're at the borders, and as we look at the challenges ahead of us, for some of us, it might look quite daunting. For some of us, we might say, I'm not sure we can do it. Between, between us getting there and being established, there are giants in the way. There are uh, strong opponents to this. And we sit at a crossroads right now. This is not theoretical. Do you understand what we're getting at? Uh, this isn't something that we should just say, well, that's a nice thought. Maybe next year I'm going to really take it serious. We're there. We're there. I, 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 and, and God wants us to learn, and He wants us to move and grow. So I've been showing you this kind of uh, a graph in this journey. We've already looked at all the negative attitudes as the story goes through. We looked at doubt that led to rebellion last week. And again, I'm just kind of squishing together the last two. And we could throw a dozen more stories and attitudes in here, but we're just going to condense it here so that faith, by the time we come up this this evolution that God wants to take us through of changing our hearts and changing our minds as we are building in this faith and then ultimately accepting God's plan for our lives and submission to Him uh, really come hand in hand. So I, I hope you can go with me on that. Another little illustration. In this tree of life that we want to be part of, uh, and just another way of illustrating how these attitudes, we need to be rooted in thankfulness first and foremost. We need to be nourished by an attitude of no matter, and this is, again, how faith develops and grows. It's really hard to imagine, how are you going to have faith if you're constantly unthankful? It doesn't work that way. If you have developed an attitude of not being thankful, an attitude of complaining, then when the time of faith really comes, you're going to be lacking in the nourishment that you need. The journey of this life that we are on really begins with a, 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 a foregone uh, 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 purpose in your life that I will understand what God is doing for me and I'll be thankful for what He gives me. Then the stability factor of the trunk of this tree that unites the, uh, the, the roots to the branches is learning to be content content. And this, uh, Paul talks about this. We already looked at this. I realize this is a little bit of a review uh, that we can grow in understanding God's provision for us and be content. Then the branches of the tree, that which absorbs the love of God, the sunshine, and that which stretches out its arms to touch those around and to provide the capacity for faith to grow, that is love. And then again, the most beautiful part of the tree is the blossoms. Oh, forgive me, I'm using an apple tree here. I realize we're kind of more in orange country. Nick, where are you? 
right there. So the oranges look great in the orchard, don't they? Are they ready to pick yet? Are they getting close? I, I did not. I come from the Northwest. I come from apple country. I come from God's country, not, not this. No, that's this. Uh-huh. This is promise. Life. I come from apple country, so I use an apple tree. And uh, now there's a lot of, there's more myth than there is truth about Johnny Appleseed, but one of the things he's credited with saying is there's nothing so much like as heaven on earth as an apple orchard in full blossom. And I don't know how many of you guys have ever walked through an apple orchard in full blossom, but I can kind of see where he's coming from. When you see those trees, the fragrances, the blooms, um, it is just uh, very, very powerful. But our faith Our faith is that beautiful expression that is attractive, that provides the ability for the fruit to develop. So in this analogy, and then submission is the actual production of fruit and the capacity for reproduction. This, friends, this is the tree of life. This is the tree of life. Every part is important, but if we want to be part of that tree, and the Bible calls the church, a tree. If we want to be part of it, we need to understand how each of these things are developing in our lives. And we can't leave any part out. How well is this tree going to live or how productive is it going to be if it doesn't have a trunk or if it neglects the roots or if it never blossoms? We want to be developing in all these areas and faith is the most beautiful part at least it could be argued as the most beautiful part. So what is faith? We tried to define things along the way. Again, we can't get into deep, you know, theology and history and all that. Um, one that I like that I, as I study this, just active confidence in God. It sounds simple, right? It sounds simple. But as you really think about it, it's a living, breathing thing. Active confidence. It's not passive. The capacity to trust God's promises, believing God's words more than your own feelings, opinions, or viewpoint. Do you really, if your feelings are going one way, but your clear understanding of the revealed word of God is going a different way, which one will you believe? If your viewpoints and opinions are strongly pulling you one way, but the Word of God seems to indicate there's a different reality, which way are you going to accept? You know, and again, I hesitate on this one because I think we trick ourselves so often. We, con- we convince ourselves that our feelings are what God wants us. And you hear this all the time. Oh, I feel this way, therefore it must be true. I feel that this is the best thing to do. I feel that I was justified in doing this. My feelings control and dictate my life, and that God just has to agree with that. And that was the decision that Eve made when she chose to eat from the, true, from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. She followed her feelings, didn't she? You remember the story in Genesis? She looked at the tree and said, it looks good to me. I know God said there's a problem with it, but my feelings, my flesh, my opinions say differ, different, and I'm choosing that over God's Word. And the root of all sin comes into the human experience at that moment. Faith is so much more than a, a code of beliefs. This is really where the Jews, I think my voice just cracked there, Jeff, <clears throat> this is really where the Jews went wrong. <laughs> I sometimes get a little overexcited. This is where the Jews went wrong. They were so focused on the the isms of the law that they missed when the lawgiver stood among them. They were so focused on the, the, the dynamics and details of the Sabbath that when the Lord of the Sabbath stood in their midst, they said, we don't even know who you are. They were so focused on their own expression of religion that when God himself came into their midst, they crucified him. And we have the benefit of looking back on that and saying, I don't want that to be me, but yet the human nature, the brokenness of sin continually pulls us in that direction of establishing uh, a a, a difference between believing God and believing a set of value statements or something like that. Believing God's Word. Knowing God's heart when all else fails. I want to give you guys a a little example that's been helpful for me in what it really means to trust someone. If we were to make an appointment together, 
Thank you. Isn't that lovely? And the water is good too. Thank you. If we were to make an appointment together and we, and we said, okay, let's meet at 10 o'clock. You're going to meet at 10? Yeah, we're going to meet at 10 o'clock. And let's say you show up at the right place, the right time at 10 o'clock, and I'm not there. Okay? I'm not there. I made a commitment, but I'm not there. If we have a loving, faithful, trusting relationship, your thought is not going to be, what a slacker. What an absolute failure. Here he gave me a commitment, and he's not, I can't believe I would even have anything to do with this individual, right? That, that's not a good, a good thing. Where if you have a loving, trusting relationship, your default's going to be, Some, I know he wouldn't have done this on purpose. Obviously, maybe there was traffic, maybe there was an emergency, maybe something came up that was so critical, but I know his heart, irregardless of, the, you know, of, of, of something that happened, I know their heart. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, yeah, I'm not trying to suggest in any way that God's Word is insufficient or God's Word fails, but there are times when we are confused at God's Word. We are not clear on God's Word or we've mistaken God's Word, and it leads us to conclusions that we're uncomfortable with. But when you really trust the heart of God, you will be patient to let His Word come to be revealed in time. When you really trust someone's heart, and when you come to the uh, conviction and the knowledge that God is good, God is good, He's not going to let you down. Faith is not the absence of doubts, but trusting God in spite of our doubts. So, I'm going to go through this kind of quick um, uh, just to, again, get some information out there to, to think about when it comes to faith. First, faith is real. Last week, I talked about it's not really biblical to have a blind leap of faith. You don't really find that. Even when, even when Jesus tells Peter to get out of the boat and walk on water, who was out there on the water already? Jesus was already out there. And say, that is an amazing thing. That is a leap of faith. Well, yes, it obviously took a lot of faith, but he had the evidence of that faith standing in front of him. Faith is not a, a, a blind leap that we're sometimes led to believe. There is uh, very often, again, there are exceptions, I will accept, but the, 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 uh, the standard is that God gives us enormous evidence and then says, will you believe? Will you follow? Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not, uh, not seen. There's substance. There's evidence. It's not blind. I like how the New Living, the first one's the New King James. This, I like how the New Living puts it. Faith shows the reality of what we hope for. It is the evidence of things we cannot see. God does not put us in a blind box and then just say, uh, uh, I'm not going to give you any evidence, just trust. He always gives us ample evidence. It's found in the Bible, it's found in history, it's found in our relationships. If we're looking for it, we will find it all over. Faith is personal. Like I mentioned with the Jews before, they missed the personal relationship with God. They got caught up in their isms. Hebrews says that we need to fix our eyes on Jesus. Now, I, I love and embrace the fact that we have a very broad set of beliefs and creeds and statements that, that we believe express our faith, but ultimately, we are not fixing our eyes on Jesus if we are only looking at the Ten Commandments uh, isolated in, 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 in just the context of a creedal statement, right? This is what the Jews did. They were very good commandment keepers, but they missed Jesus, who is the, the, the very character of Jesus, is what the law was supposed to teach us about. Faith is about a relationship, not just uh, believing a code of doctrines. We fix our eyes on Jesus, who's the author and perfecter of faith. For consider Him, Him. Faith is personal, who's endured such hostility by sinners against Himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Faith is about a relationship with a God who loves you. Faith is active. Faith changes us. Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead being, it, being by itself, but I will show you my faith by my works. Faith does not work if it is just, again, something we internalize but doesn't actually change us. The righteous man, uh, Paul reminds us in Romans, it's a quote from Habakkuk, but the righteous man shall live by faith. Faith is active. It changes us. It produces a response system in us. Faith is a gift. 
By the grace, for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Now, there's a great debate <laughs> in theology. What is the gift of God? Is it the grace or is it the faith? For by the grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. What is the it referencing? Is it grace or faith? Is it grace or is it faith? I think it's both. If you knew the gift of God, here's the same, that same word, the gift of God. If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked and he would have given you living water. The ability to have the assurance of the connection with God that produces eternal life comes through the combination of grace working with faith. So I think that it is both. And we can debate and talk about that later. There's a Bible study after potluck if you want to join us too. <laughs> faith is the victory. Faith is a choice. I have chosen the faithful way, Psalms 119 says. I have placed your ordinances before me. And then I love it how the apostles themselves came, come to Jesus and they say, Lord, increase our faith. Increase our faith. They ask the Lord. We know that the level of faith and the understanding of faith that we have has only brought us so far, and there's more that you have for us. Increase our faith. There's a great humility and beauty to that request to Jesus Christ. I've been using, um, oh, I'll come to it in just a second. The last couple of verses here, and I know I'm throwing a lot of verses here uh, at the end. You are from God, little children, and have overcome them. But greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. You've heard that one before, right? It's a great, uh, a great statement of understanding that God is always on our side. And then uh, just one chapter later, whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our Sabbath keeping. It's overcome the world. Boy, you are zoned out, aren't you? This is the victory that has overcome the world, our faithful tithe pain overcome the world. Wearing the right clothes to church on Sabbath, that has overcome the world. All those things have their place, right? The thing that is going to make us overcomers is our faith in the heart and love of Jesus Christ and applying His Word to our lives. And even when we're afraid, saying, I would rather be with Him who is greater than anyone else who is in the world. I'm not going to use an historical illustration like I've done the last couple of weeks, but because I've done that, I want to give you a quote from Stonewall Jackson. He was a radical Presbyterian, 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 <laughs> uh, quite uh, eccentric to say the least. Um, he was called Stonewall Jackson for a variety of reasons, but one of them in, in, I think it was the Battle of Bull Run, when all the other rebel soldiers were fleeing, um, he was standing on his horse saying, you know, we shouldn't be fleeing. And then the soldier said, look, there's uh, General Jackson standing like a stone wall. And then they, uh, they uh, turned around and they uh, continued fighting and they, and they won the first Battle of Manassas or Bull Run, depending on how you call it. But he was a radical Christian. He did own a few slaves because those slaves asked him to buy him, to buy them. Um, those slaves uh, were not comfortable in the circumstances that they were, and he believed that uh, slaves should be tra treated humanely. He fought for the South, but he was a, uh, a radical Christian. And um, one time he was asked, how is it that you're so calm on the battlefield? And he said, the Lord has set aside the time of my death. And no matter what man can do can change that. I'm as safe on the battlefield as I am in bed. Again, pretty eccentric. Why should the peace of a true Christian be disturbed by anything which man can do unto him? Has not God promised to make all things work together for good for those who love him? To have faith to stand no matter what is happening in the battle is, is what I'm trying to illustrate from this man, that even when the bullets are flying, that I am still in the hand of God. 
even when the situation looks dire, God is still in control. Why should the peace of a true Christian be disturbed by anything which man can do unto him? So, some honest questions here at the end. Lord, is my faith real? Is it alive? And is it personal? Do you ever feel like apologizing to the Lord when you haven't prayed for a while? I hadn't called my mom in quite a while. So just the other day, I called, and I, it had been so long, I felt like I had to apologize. I said, I'm so sorry. It has been a while since I called. She said, I understand. You're a bad son. No, she didn't say that. She said, I understand. We all get busy. But this is how you really know that your faith is personal. If it's been a while since you've really intimately prayed, do you realize that there is a personal God up there who misses you? He misses you. Or is it just a ritual that you do because that's what you're supposed to do? When's the last time you really reviewed your faith as a relationship with God? Are you putting your whole trust in Him? Do you feel that you're stronger today in your faith than you were last year? Have you fallen behind? Are you about to say, are you growing in your faith? What evidence has God given you for His plan in your life? Are you looking for it? I think God gives us miracles all the time. All the time. God shows His miraculous power in our life. And if we're looking, we'll see it. When was the last time you prayed, Lord, I love the faith that I have, but I want more. Give me more faith. You know, God loves those prayers. He loves those prayers. He loves to answer those prayers. What will you do while we are waiting on the borders of the promised land? The report has come back. The spies have gone out. The majority say it's impossible. The majority say the enemy is stronger. The majority have exaggerated the report to say that God is incapable. But there's a few who are standing up saying, God has surely said we will be victorious. Let us trust Him more than what man may say. What will you do? Let's let our faith shine. Let's let that beautiful blossom of faith grow in our lives. Let's pray. Lord, thank You that we can consider these things today. Thank You that we can witness an expression of faith uh, in our worship, in our singing, but also, Lord, in Drew's baptism. What a blessing. Thank You that we can be part of that journey together. So, Father, as each of us face our own trials, as we as a congregation as a world church also considers our place in this journey as we get closer and closer to crossing that Jordan River and going into the promised land. Father, help us to be nurtured by a spirit of thankfulness. Help us to be strong as a trunk of contentment in what you've done for us. Help us to spread out our arms in love and receive the warmth and shelter of the branches of love that you give to us. And Lord, may the blessings of the beauty and the perfume and the joy and softness of faith explode from our lives so that we can be fruitful in this work for you in these days in which we live. Keep us strong. Keep us on the path you have for us, Lord. Increase our faith, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Happy Sabbath. We look forward to seeing you again next week. Potluck right next door here if you want to come and have a meal. We've got some outside picnic tables now to enjoy that.